Well, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, you could have warned me beforehand that it was going to be hot here. As usual, I'm completely overdressed. Um, I, so I'll, I'll struggle through that. Um, uh, let me start in a very British way with apologies. As has been said, I'm not Sven Biskop. I am the Notfalllösung, um, so I apologize for that. Oh, I'm not, okay. I'm, well, I'm, I'm more than the Notfalllösung, um, or it's a big Notfall that I'm the Lösung for. Um, uh, secondly, I'm British. Um, I apologize for that. On, only in the sense that it means that you won't understand the English that I'm speaking. <laughs> Nothing more than that. But please do wave if you don't understand. And thirdly, I've been asked to frame this debate, um, which is a phenomenally tricky task. And actually, last time Rosa and I were, were at a meeting together, we were discussing this before, the, the chap from, from uh, the council in, in Brussels said, we didn't just come from a different planet, we came from a different galaxy. Um, so uh, what I can at least promise to do, I think, is be, is be as brief as possible. I've been told 50 minutes, and I have my alarm clock with me, so I will do my best. Um, what I want to do quickly is to just get across three key messages, which I think are important. Um, and I hope you agree, and then, and then end with a couple of scenarios. And what I've been asked to do is to try to give an impression of what is at stake in this debate. Um, the, the first thing I want to get across, the first message, I think, is that we mustn't use refugees as metaphors. Um, when I read the terms of the debate, the sort of quo vadis, the existential, the make or break idea for Europe, it worries me that we're dragging migrants and refugees um, uh, into a debate as metaphors uh, and as proxies for the bigger question of what kind of Europe we want. Um, perhaps it's just for me as a Brit, but I find that a little bit dangerous um, that we're sort of dragging this into a sort of value-laden identity battle. Um, so I just wanted to sound a, a word of caution there. Um, uh, if we can, during the course of this debate, avoid one or two things which I think um, plague liberal and progressive debates elsewhere, then I would be pleased. Um, let me just name a couple of these pitfalls. Firstly, I think there's a dreadful um, danger if we talk in these sort of value-laden terms of polarizing the debate further. We hear a lot of virulent and unpleasant statements coming from sections of the media and from political parties, um, and that's often associated also, as, as has been sort of alluded to, with Eastern Europe. I play cricket, so it's good to be British occasionally. Um, there's a temptation, I think, to respond in kind to those sorts of statements, and all I want to do is sound a note of caution. Um, because I think that quite often those voices are talking in terms of metaphors. They may be talking about refugees, but they're talking about something deeper. And I think if we're listening to the debate in, in Eastern Europe, where I was based for a while, we need to be listening a little bit for the subtext. People are talking about other things, so they may be talking on the surface about refugees, but something else is going on. So that's the first thing. Don't, don't, use, don't use them as metaphors in that sense. Um, the second pitfall a little bit is that I think we sometimes risk supporting the wrong kind of messages and debates. So we listen to some political um, agendas and think, ah, oh, that's progressive because it's in favor of um, uh, the refugee regime or the migration regime. And in actual fact, in the broader scheme of things, it's anything but progressive. So my big sort of boo man at the moment is the demographic argument um, that we say, well, Germany need, you know, has a demographic deficit. We need these people. It sounds progressive. I don't think it is. I think it's incredibly dehumanizing, right? Hey. Um, so I'm not alone. Um, and, and perhaps on a, on a lesser level, there's an awful lot of sort of buzz at the moment about um, large cities um, sort of taking a progressive role in, in the migration debate. Fine, but again, I think it's very divisive. I want to hear from rural communities. I want to hear from the maritime uh, areas that are being hit by this. Um, so that's, that's sort of the second pitfall a little bit, that, that I, I worry that we, uh, that we support the wrong messages. Um, I think if we're using or if we're engaged in this sort of existential debate, there's a risk, too, that we sort of end up being manipulated and blackmailed by other countries. To the east and to the south, they're very keen to criticize our failure to live up to our values, and that pushes us into more navel-gazing. Um, but actually, what we're being measured by is our action, not our words. So I, I worry a little bit uh, about that. And my final point here is really just that I think migration works best when it's allowed to work quietly. 
um, and a lot of the processes that go on function very well without too much interference. Um, refugees and migrants have enough on their plate at the moment without being caught up in a sort of existential debate about Europe and so on. So that's my first message, that we need to sort of stay away from, from turning refugees and migrants into, a, into sort of metaphors about a bigger debate that we want about Europe. My second message is that I don't think we can create the Europe we'd like unless we understand better the Europe that we have. And the message I want to get across here is, is a slightly unpopular one, I think, but I think it's important to say. And it's that uh, really just to realize that the EU hasn't been as bad on migration as we think it has. I'm not going to defend the last two years or so of record, but I want to look back historically, because for the last 25 years or so, We've had a stream of criticism about Europe and fortress Europe in particular. The idea of externalization, that the EU is outsourcing its border controls to other countries. Securitization, that we're turning down refugees and migrants on the grounds of internal security. Um, if you go to Brussels now and you say the words fortress Europe, then officials will look at you like you're mad and say, we wish. Um, so there's, there is some sort of mismatch there. And the deeper point I want to make is that there is a liberal basis to European migration policy that I think we need to be aware of. And I'll take you back to the 1990s, where European policymakers faced a real dilemma when the wall came down. Suddenly they were exposed to massive flows of migration from the East, and the International Labour Organization was talking about 25 million people who were going to come, and UNHCR was talking about 9 million people coming. Um, and there was a lot of pressure to roll back on the international refugee regime and on the Schengen zone as it was putatively then. Um, and I think policymakers realized at the time that yes, they were exposed by the fall of the wall, but it had also opened up uh, new vistas for intervention abroad. And that's kind of the liberal basis that the that European migration policy has been based on for the last 25 years. Um, it's been based on state building and development abroad. It's been based on uh, spreading best practice uh, to other countries so that they can take the refugee burden. Um, uh, I don't defend the, the progress that's been made after 25 years, but I do think it's important to realize that there has been a liberal basis for this for two reasons. The first is that I think many of the most criticized measures that the EU has in place have that liberal basis to them. So if we're talking about the Dublin relocation mechanism, if we're talking about Frontex, if we're talking about returning people to Turkey, if we're talking about gunboats in the Mediterranean, then very often that's a hangover from that older sort of liberal interventionist approach where, whereby we try to spread our standards. Again, that's not a defense of these measures, but it's important to know because I think that a lot of the people who are making proposals for reform at the moment, because they believe that everything that has gone before was illiberal, think that they're making liberal proposals just because they're proposing an alternative. And actually what they're doing quite often is proposing more of the same, whether it be ideas such as human security or improving protection abroad. So these are ideas that have been tried already. And I think we need to recognize that we've been sort of living sort of liberalism gone sour to realize that we, we need to work a bit harder um, if we want to propose liberal and progressive alternatives. The second reason I mention this is because I think a lot of um, people making proposals at the moment think that their proposals are being turned down because they're too ambitious. And in actual fact, I think it's because they're not ambitious enough. So when people propose things like creating humanitarian visas or giving Frontex, the EU's borders agency, uh, a role in search and rescue, they think our oh, politicians are turning that down um, uh, because, it's, because it's too ambitious. I think they need to realize that what has gone before was a whole sort of liberal world vision in which our policymakers believed that they could lift the root causes of uh, involuntary migration by spreading democracy and prosperity. Um, uh, that hasn't happened, but that system has gone, and that system allowed them enormous scope to act, both in terms of giving people abroad a reason to stay at home and build institutions, and also on occasions a justification for taking more restrictive measures to keep people there because they believe that prosperity and democracy were spreading. That's gone. And so I think, you know, in that vacuum, there's enormous scope to make new proposals. 
Um, but we need to think in a more systematic approach, and that means, I think, putting migration at the heart of international affairs, whereas over the last 25 years it's been rather pushed aside in favour of state building and, and trade promotion. So that's my second point. I've done about seven minutes, so that's all right. Um, that we can't create the Europe we'd like until we understand the Europe we have. Third point, third message, and then I'll get on to the scenarios. Um, it may very well be that it's the refugees themselves and not the EU that don't live up to our ideals. Again, I make this, this point with all caution, um, but I think it's an important one. I, I don't by any means dispute the fact that there are enormous vulnerable populations who have arrived in Europe um, uh, who are in a very sort of classic refugee situation. If you go to Lesbos, if you go to the Pikpa camp, um, run for vulnerable people, you find people there who have been sorted out of uh, Moria detention camp with enormous speed before they can even claim asylum. So they're in limbo. If you go to mainland Greece, you find thousands of people who are still struggling to get access to procedures because their Skype appointments are difficult to do. We're struggling also with the significant shift in the nature of flows towards the beginning of this year. So I think in September of last year, the flows coming across the Aegean were still heavily male dominated and only one ninth uh, of the flows were children. By February, it was one third of people were minors and they were heavily um, female dominated. Those people are now often stuck in Greece and on the islands where their family members are abroad. Um, uh, so I don't in any way dispute that we do have a classic refugee situation. What I do want to suggest also is that mobility can mean personal empowerment, that the people who've been able to move are the lucky ones to a degree. And if we're talking about a global refugee crisis, if we look at the numbers, what we're really talking about is a global IDP crisis, a crisis of internally displaced people, enormous trapped populations who can't leave their homelands. Um, you can see that in Syria, the price of being smuggled across the Syrian Turkish border has apparently risen in the last few months from about 40 US dollars to about 1300 by some information. It's harder to get out. You can see it in Libya, where of the 400,000 known IDPs, 86% of them have been displaced in about the last 16 months. Um, uh, and you can see the flip side of that also in figures from the OECD on the people who are coming from Syria, from Afghanistan, that the people who move furthest and first are often the wealthiest and the best educated. Um, it's very European to see mobility as a vulnerability and to see all the benefits of sort of territorial orders falling to people who's, who, who settle down. Um, but I think that's being flipped on its head a little bit. And I think we, you know, it's not a new message, but I, I reiterate it here, that it may be that the lucky people are the ones who are able to move and we're facing enormous trap populations elsewhere. Those are my three messages. I want to finish with just to make it a little bit more concrete if I can, the idea of all this question of what is at stake. Um, let me give you two scenarios. One a more positive one, I think, one a, one, a, one a less positive one. In the more positive scenario, the EU uses this window of opportunity created by the EU-Turkey joint statement, which has brought a certain calm to the European Union in order to put its migration and refugee policy on a more sustainable footing. When I'm having discussions in Brussels, um, there are a certain number of principles that I think I hear, and I think, well, that there's a possible basis for something more sustainable, more positive. L let me name four of them. And I'm afraid they're a little bit jargony, but that's how Brussels is. So bad luck, get on with it. I'm British, I suffer more. First one is this idea of recognizing human agency. Um, it's basically this idea that, that not all refugees are helpless, are hopeless, and we need to help them help themselves. That applies to Europe, helping people get into the labor market, helping people um, be quickly uh, uh, integrated. But it applies equally outside. It may even apply to Syria. And there's a lot of discussion on how do we get away from classic humanitarianism and how do we much more mix our security policies with our development policies so that we can help people in some really precarious positions support themselves and have access to the international labor market. So that's the first thing, support human agency. The second uh, is, is the idea that people should have opportunities as close to home as possible. Um, so that's not about sort of classic state building, but it is recognizing uh, that there are certain regional dynamics at play. 
um, that we may be able to build on to support people closer to home. It's notable, I think, and this is something that people in Brussels talk about a lot, that just as we're talking about scrapping the Schengen area in our free movement zone, that virtually every other part of the rest of the world is talking about creating one. In West Africa, in East Africa, in South Africa, in Latin America, in the Caribbean, people are trying to create free movement zones. So we do see that there are sort of regional dy dynamics emerging. Again, this has pluses and minuses, but that's sort of the second principle. Can we build in a sort of regional layer? It's, it's emerging de facto, so how do we support it? Third principle is that I think the EU is becoming much more interested in, in what you'd call sort of uneven partnerships. So we had the meeting back in, I think, October, November between the EU and uh, uh, African countries. And it was a very sort of classic affair, a big sort of grand deal, big, big quid pro quo. We give the Africans some money. They agree to keep their people at home. And I think, you know, th the deal, most people can see, is not, is not truly sustainable. But there's growing interest, I think, in saying, OK, well, where can we actually work with African countries on shared interests? Why aren't we pooling our diplomatic resources in order to put pressure on Gulf countries to open up their labor markets and treat migrants better? We both have an interest in that. We're not even partners. We have far more resources, but we have a common interest. So I think there's, there's a sense that we can work with partners that we haven't worked with before to, put, to, to get things done. And the fourth principle, I think, which has positive overtones, is that there's a desire to work with what you might call sort of progressive rivals. States from Turkey to Brazil, which uh, dislike the degree of power that the West exercises, but is prepared to use humanitarian means in order to sort of challenge that mantle. So can we encourage them to develop their humanitarian policies, even if it comes at our own status and power? So that's sort of the fourth thing. That's the sort of positive scenario. The negative one, which I think is altogether uh, possible, is one of fragmentation and disintegration. It's the EU's free movement of labor zone split into two, a sort of rump eurozone core with deeper free movement of labor as it tries to pass around structural unemployment and a periphery in Eastern Europe and in Western Europe of non-eurozone states who have a sort of lesser relationship. It's a Schengen zone that's been torn three ways between southern uh, European member states who are keen on protecting their maritime border and keeping people out, of eastern member states trying to keep local flows across the border so there isn't a new iron curtain across Europe, uh, and northwestern member states trying to keep Heathrow and Charles de Gaulle going because what they're interested in is highly globalized labor movements. It's trying to make Schengen uh, fit these three things, which is no longer possible. It's a picture of the EU and its neighborhood split four ways into different free movement zones. The EU, a sort of borderless, lawless zone in the south, to the east, Russia and the Eurasian Economic Union, Russia exploiting uh, the sort of remittance dependency of countries like Moldova or Armenia in order to draw uh, these states towards it, but flushing on uh, uh, refugees from Syria or Iraq towards Europe, and a series of smaller sort of buffer zones in between, such as the Western Balkans. But above all, I think it's a picture of the EU which is so busy keeping people out that it's forgotten that other countries are watching how they treat their citizens and thinking, well, we can treat European citizens like that. Because we all, I think, increasingly will have an interest in traveling outside of the EU. And I think with a very short-term policy, the EU itself risks forgetting that. Um, let me just finish by saying that I think we're already in a very crucial period. Ralph mentioned that we, we need to be thinking already, how do we do long-term policies at a very short notice? June is going to be crucial. Um, if Assad spots that the U.S. is losing interest ahead of the elections, there'll be an escalation of violence there. That will hit Libya, where anyway flows across the uh, Mediterranean by Eritreans, by West Africans, pick up at this time of year. It will hit the Western Balkans, where seasonal migration flows um, pick up at this time of year. Um, at the beginning of June, we've got... Uh, a sort of deepening of the uh, EU-Turkey deal um, and the returns policy. We have the UK referendum on the 23rd and at the end of the month a decision on whether to lift uh, visas uh, for Turkey. Um, 
that's an incredibly critical and vulnerable period for the European Union. I think the next five or six weeks are going to be incredibly key. I've talked a lot about the sort of long-term perspective, but these long-term changes, as Ralph has mentioned, need to be made already now. Um, so uh, I think you know, I can only underline the fact that this is, uh, as we meet here today in Berlin, an incredibly critical period. Um, and I hope I've framed the debate and I've spoken for an extra two minutes, but uh, uh, bad luck. Thank you.